Hello, happy Christmas and happy holidays for those of you who love this time of year. And for those of you who maybe don't love this time of year, maybe find it a bit stressful and difficult, well done, you're getting through it. Um, as always, we're streaming uh, live now on Facebook and YouTube and Twitch. And if you need to find the links, uh, go to my website, michellepaver.com slash chat. Uh, you can send me a message right now on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or YouTube. Uh, I'm going to have to read the next bit. On Twitter and Instagram, use the hashtag Michelle Pay and show your message right here on screen. On Facebook and YouTube, you don't need a hashtag. Uh, just post a message on the live stream chat and we'll see it straight away. And here's a little Christmas bonus for you, just to let you know. In a few minutes time, I'm going to be giving away Way, uh, a specially signed proof copy of my new novel Wakenhurst uh, with very fancy Wakenhurst gift wrapping paper uh, with complete with a real magpie's feather. Um, the publishers have produced this thing and it's so rare that there we are even I don't have one of these things so they're very rare. Um, just so you know um, a proof copy means that it's not the final final finished version of the book which hasn't been printed yet and is printed and published in beginning of April. So it's got almost all correct it's just got a few typographical errors and things and it's the copy that is produced to give to reviewers and people who are going to read it in advance and people like Wake Waterstones and that sort of thing so there we are it's very very beautiful and in a few minutes I'll tell you how to win it and um, there's only one copy and it will go to the first person to post a tweet or a Facebook YouTube or Instagram message using a certain word that I will tell you in a few minutes. So all you've got to do is, once you hear that word, you post a tweet or a Facebook, YouTube or Instagram message. Um, and uh, if you can't remember what I've just said, don't worry, all these instructions are on my website, michellepaver.com slash chat. So now we have the social media roundup. Yeah, we're a little bit of a different order this time. We're gonna have the social media roundup then very few questions. That'll just take a couple of minutes because I think everybody's questioned out. Um, and then then after we've just dealt with those questions and comments, I'll give you that word uh, and you can win them or not the Wakenhurst wrapped proof. And then I'm going to have just one recommendation of a book and it's a book of short stories. And because it's Christmas, I'm going to read you one of them. It's just a short story. So a little bit different. Um, so now social media. Uh, oh, yes. Well, we have been getting some reaction because some of those Wakenhurst parcels have been going out. Um, sorry, can we go back to Stuart? Yes, there we go. Um, he said some lovely things, Stuart Campbell, um, a man obviously of impeccable literary taste. So thank you very much, Stuart, for um, enjoying and actually posting that you enjoyed Wakenhurst. Um, now we go to Amanda Craig has um, been discussing some wonderful author uh, as well as a, a journalist. Check out her Lie of the Land. It's really excellent. Um, she's been talking about, you know, why do film producers just remake old movies like Mary Poppins? What are the other stories that might be made into films? Thank you for mentioning Wolf Brother, Amanda, but some really interesting suggestions. Children of Green Noah um, and other people have chimed in. Um, and uh, again, Amanda came up with, you know, the weird stone of Brisingerman, Alangana, and yes, Elidor. I really enjoyed that. Someone else mentioned Carbonell. I, that really brought back memories. I used to love the Carbonell books when I was a kid. Um, so yeah, and maybe you've got ideas or maybe you've got ideas for books that you wouldn't want to see adapted. Um, fascinating. Meanwhile, over in Worcester, um, which is uh, England, for those of you who are overseas, 
The hard-working students of Perry Wood Primary School have been trying to turn Wolf Brother into a computer game. Um, fascinating. I can't comment either way on how good the computer game is or give an official endorsement, but by all means, if you'd like to post it on YouTube, that would be fascinating. Um, Ginny on Twitter, this has all been on Twitter so far, sorry, um, has been listening to the audio of uh, Dark Matter, beautifully read by Jeremy Northam, thoroughly enjoying it. Um, glad, of, glad for that, Ginny. Um, and, uh, oh, there's a wonderful, very harsh life rule. If you find yourself in a Michelle Paler novel, cancel your holiday. Harsh, but yeah, I like that. And then we've got, oh yes, some Instagram have got some unanswered questions from, oh yes, and if, if you, the hashtags here uh, for Instagram are Chronicles of Ancient Darkness or Grow the Fandom Like the First Tree or just use my name as a hashtag. Um, some tough questions. Uh, yeah, what are the names of Torak's parents? You're never going to find out. Um, did all of the Soul Eaters really die? That is a massive spoiler. I'm not going to answer that. What happened with Dark's family? Again, not going to answer that. And this that this well-tried one, which it always amazes me that people kind of don't know the answer to this, but um, would Wren have stayed with Bale uh, when he asked, or if he asked? Um, she never got to answer Torak when he asked at the end of Oathbreaker. Well... <laughs> Oh, she likes, she loves Torag. But anyway, um, there we go. And finally, oh yes, almost finally, Pella and Pollen have made some gorgeous Rowanberry uh, bracelets, just like Ren gives Torag. Those are just beautiful. Thank you for posting that. And some more clan, real clan tattoos here. Um, very, very cool indeed. Uh, wolf clan tattoos. Um, just in, in terms of these tattoos, you know, make sure you're the right legal age and get it done by a reputable tattooist. I feel I have to say that for health and safety. Oh, and then finally we have, um, oh yes, um, Babe Elephant found one of my earlier books, Fever Hill. Get this, in a bakery in Kuala Lumpur. I mean, how cool is that? Fantastic. Thank you for that. Anybody else who's found one of my books in an odd or seen it in an odd place, do post a picture on Instagram. That'd be fascinating. Finally, um, Yes, a sculptor, Upton Ethelbar, I hope I've pronounced that right, and um, that, that's actually, an, Ethelbar is an anglicisation of um, uh, White Mountain Apache name, Grey Shoes, and Little Grey Shoes is that, is that incredibly cute dog, which is half Pomeranian and half, half Husky. Um, thank you for posting that, um, really lovely. Oh, and, and finally, I should just mention on... Um, social and all that sort of thing. I was on, for those of you in England, I was on uh, Radio 4 Start the Week on Christmas Eve. Um, quite an interesting discussion with Andrew Marr, I, I liked it anyway, about ice and snow. So I was talking about dark matter, that's what made me think of it. Um, and with some, the wonderful poet Nancy Campbell uh, and the um, material scientist Mark Wiedowski, I can't remember how I pronounce his name, and Ben Saunders, who's um, a great, uh, polar Explorer. So that was fascinating. And you can catch that on BBC iPlayer if you have access to it. So there we are. That's um, dealt with that. And we're now coming to the questions, which are very brief. I think we are all questioned out. So or maybe you're just saving them for the new year. Um, so firstly, we've got a question from Debbie McCullough, uh, who's from Brighton College, just asking, could we book a school visit? Uh, for 2019. Well, I don't have any plans, Debbie, for doing school visits because I'm going to be really busy promoting Wakenhurst and also writing, finishing one book and writing another. It's going to be a very busy year. Um, I might be doing school visits, I don't know, in 2020. However, this website isn't the place to book them. Um, that That is it's best to go through either Puffin or Ashet Children's Books, who, who um, publish Wolf Brother. Um, I'm afraid I can't give you a name because I haven't had any contact with Ashet Children's Books for a couple of years now, but there we go. Um, Gabriella Lewis uh, was wondering if I'd like a manga adaptation of Gods and Warriors. Um, I don't know much about manga, but uh, I think she, Gabriella's keen on producing visualization and uh, it's, it's a great idea. 
Gabrielle, I can't sort of enter into a contract about it. And so if any money were involved, please, you know, that's probably not a good idea because there are all sorts of film deals and things like that. Um, so, but if you just want to do some fan art for fun and post it on um, uh, Instagram, uh, usual hashtags, Chronicles of Ancient Darkness or Grow the Fandom Like the, the First Tree or Michelle Paver, great idea and it'd be lovely to see. Um, we've got a lovely, um, yes, Harriet has posted, this is one of her first, I think it was her first tattoo dedicated to Chronicles, a beautiful wolf, so that's lovely. Um, a lot of you have tattoos, it's very, very cool. We have a genuine question here, Sumaya and Cedra, how would you feel if Torak's dad was your dad? Well, if Torak's dad was my dad, then I would be Torak. And how I feel is in the book. I think I got out of that really well, didn't I? Um, so there we are. And I think this is the last one. Yes. And finally, we've got a really nice comment from Simon Hogg. Um, just wanted to thank you for Dark Matter. It's a tremendous story. I bought it on audio and listened to it more times than I can count. Well, I think that's fantastic. It's also a tribute to Jeremy Norton's amazing reading. But thank you for getting in touch, all of you. I hope lots of you have got interesting questions uh, to come up and comments in, in the new year. But right now, uh, the moment has arrived for um, winning, if you if you want to, try that special bound copy of, uh, wrapped copy, I should say, of Wakenhurst. And it is a bit of a collector's item because, you know, there's only a few which have been produced. Um, so listen carefully. What you need to do is you need to be quick on the mark. You either send me a tweet, an Instagram post, a Facebook post, or a YouTube comment containing the following hashtag, which I'll give you. So that's all you need to do is one word, which I'll give you. Are you ready? So the person who sends the first message containing this hashtag will win. And the hashtag is hashtag Wakenhurst. <laughs> yeah, pretty obvious, wasn't it? Hashtag Wakenhurst, spelled with a Y, as you can see the spelling on the screen. So you need to be quick. And then if we get a winner, Yes, so we'll we'll move on, and I'm I'm going to be told when we get a winner, and then we'll tell you how to send in your your postal address. Um, but moving on, I'm now going to come to my recommendation. Normally, yes, I'm I'm recommending just a volume of short stories. His 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 pen name was Saki, um, and his real name was H H Munro, and he was. Uh, he was born in 1870, so he's a Victorian, but he was, you know, writing in the Edwardian times. And they are for grown-ups, really, but uh, you, know, you, you could read them if you've got a decent vocabulary as a child. They're quite dark. They're very inventive. A lot of them are very, very witty and funny. Um, oh, we have, we have a winner. We have a winner. It's Emily Last on Facebook. Well done, Emily. And um, if you could please now on michellepaper.com slash ask, fill in the form with your postal address. Uh, and then um, my amazing agent, Will Peter, will send you what you've won. So Emily last, well done. Um, superb. And I'll get back to Saki. And um, yes, so there they're weird stories, but they're very readable. Um, and I'm going to read you one. And it's one of his most famous, deservedly so, because it's an absolute classic. And I'm not going to say anything about it, except to tell you that uh, he was his parents, I think, were in Burma. And he was brought up from a very, uh, from the age of two, I think, by two aunts. And I don't think he liked them. I think he had a pretty unpleasant childhood, as you'll probably gather from this. I think some of this story is autobiographical, but not all of it. I'm going to put my reading glasses on because otherwise it's going to go fuzzy. Anyway, this is going to take about 10 minutes. I just thought it might be quite a nice thing to hunker down, listen to a story. So it's called Sredni Vashtar. Conradin was 10 years old and the doctor had pronounced his professional opinion that the boy could not live another five years. The doctor was silky and effete, 
and counted for little. But his opinion was endorsed by Mrs. de Ropp, who counted for nearly everything. Mrs. de Ropp was Conradin's cousin and guardian, and in his eyes, she represented those three-fifths of the world that are necessary and disagreeable and real. The other two-fifths, in perpetual antagonism to the foregoing, were summed up in himself and his imagination. One of these days, Conradin supposed he would succumb to the mastering pressure of wearisome necessary things, such as illnesses and coddling restrictions and drawn-out dullness. Without his imagination, which was rampant under the spur of loneliness, he would have succumbed long ago. Mrs. de Ropp would never, in her honestest moments, have confessed to herself that she disliked Conradin, though she might have been dimly aware that thwarting him for his good was a duty which she did not find particularly irksome. Conradin hated her with a desperate sincerity which he was perfectly able to mask. Such few pleasures as he could contrive for himself gained an added relish from the likelihood that they would be displeasing to his guardian, and from the realm of his imagination she was locked out, an unclean thing which should find no entrance. In the dull, cheerless garden overlooked by so many windows that were ready to open with a message not to do this or that, or a reminder that medicines were due, he found little attraction. The few fruit trees that it contained were set jealously apart from his plucking, as the rare specimens of their kind blooming in an arid waste. It would probably have been difficult to find a market gardener who would have offered ten shillings for their entire yearly produce. In a forgotten corner, however, almost hidden behind a dismal shrubbery, was a disused tool shed of respectable proportions, and within its walls Conradin found a haven, something that took on the varying aspects of a playroom and a cathedral. He had peopled it with a legion of familiar phantoms, evoked partly from fragments of history and partly from his own brain. But it also boasted two inmates of flesh and blood. In one corner lived a ragged, plumaged Houdan hen on which the boy lavished an affection that had scarcely another outlet. Further back in the gloom stood a large hutch divided into two compartments, one of which was fronted with close iron bars. This was the abode of a large polecat ferret, which a friendly butcher boy had once smuggled cage and all into its present quarters in exchange for a long secreted hoard of small silver. Conradin was dreadfully afraid of the lithe, sharp-fanged beast, but it was his most treasured possession. Its very presence in the tool shed was a secret and fearful joy, to be kept scrupulously from the knowledge of the woman, as he privately dubbed his cousin. And one day, out of heaven no material, he spun the beast a wonderful name, and from that moment it grew into a god and a religion. The woman indulged in religion once a week at a church nearby, and took Codrant Conrad in with her, but to him the church service was an alien rite. Every Thursday, in the dim and musty silence of the tool shed, he worshipped with mystic and elaborate ceremonial before the wooden hutch where dwelt Sredni Vashtar, the great ferret. Red flowers in their season and scarlet berries in the wintertime were offered at his shrine, for he was a god who laid some special stress on the fierce impatient side of things, as opposed to the woman's religion, which, as far as Conradin could observe, went to great lengths in the contrary direction. And on great festivals, powdered nutmeg was strewn in front of his hutch, an important feature of the offering being that the nutmeg had to be stolen. These festivals were irregular occurrence and were chiefly, sorry, chiefly appointed to celebrate some passing event. On one occasion, when Mrs. de Ropp suffered from acute toothache for three days, Conradin kept up the festival during the entire three days, 
and almost succeeded in persuading himself that Sredni Vashtar was personally responsible for the toothache. If the malady had lasted another day, the supply of nutmeg would have given out. The Houdan hen was never drawn into the cult of Sredni Vashtar. Conradin had long ago settled that she was an Anabaptist. He did not pretend to have the remotest knowledge as to what an Anabaptist was, but he private hoped, privately hoped that it was dashing and not very respectable. Mrs. de Ropp was the ground plan on which he based and detested all respectability. After a while, Conradin's absor absorption in the tool shed began to attract the notice of his guardian. It is not good for him to be pottering down there in all weathers, she promptly decided. And at breakfast one morning, she announced that the Houdan hen had been sold and taken away overnight. With her short-sighted eyes, she peered at Conradin, waiting for an outbreak of rage and sorrow, which she was ready to rebuke with a flow of excellent precepts and reasoning. But in said nothing. There was nothing to be said. Something perhaps in his white, set face gave her a momentary qualm, for at tea that afternoon there was toast on the table, a delicacy which she usually banned on the ground that it was bad for him. Also because the making of it gave trouble, a deadly offence in the middle-class feminine eye. I thought you liked toast, she exclaimed with an injured air, observing that he did not touch it. Sometimes, said Conradin. In the shed that evening there was an innovation in the worship of the Hutch God. Conradin had been wont to chant his praises. Tonight, he are boon. Do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. The thing was not specified. As Sredni Vashtar was a god, he must be supposed to know. And choking back a sob as he looked at that other empty corner, Conradin bent, went back to the world he so hated. And every night in the welcome darkness of his bedroom, and every evening in the dusk of the tool shed, Conradin's bitter litany went up, do one thing for me, Sredni Vashtar. Mrs. de Ropp noticed that the visits to the shed did not cease, and one day she made a further journey of inspection. What are you keeping in that locked hutch? she asked. I believe it's guinea pigs. I'll have them all cleared away. Conradin shut his lips tight, but the woman ransacked his bedroom till she found the carefully hidden key and forthwith marched down to the shed to complete her discovery. It was a cold afternoon and Conradin had been deep to the house. From the furthest window of the dining room, the door of the shed could just be seen beyond the corner of the shrubbery, and there Conradin stationed himself. He saw the woman enter, and then he imagined her opening the door of the sacred hutch and peering down with her short-sighted eyes into the thick straw bed where he lay hidden. Perhaps she would prod at the straw in her clumsy impatience, and Conradin fervently breathed his prayer for the last time. But he knew, as he prayed, that he did not believe. He knew that the woman would come out presently with that pursed smile he loathed so well on her face, and that in an hour or two the gardener would carry away his wonderful god, a god no longer but a simple brown ferret in a hutch. And he knew that the woman would triumph always, as she triumphed now, and that he would grow ever more sickly under her pestering and domineering and superior wisdom, till one day nothing would matter very much more with him and the doctor would be proved right. And in the sting and misery of his defeat, he began to chant loudly and defiantly the hymn of his threatened idol. Sredni Vashtar went forth. His thoughts were red thoughts, and his teeth were white. His enemies called for peace, but he brought them death. Sredni Vashtar the beautiful. And then, of a sudden, he stopped his chanting and drew closer to the windowpane. The door of the shed stood still 
still stood ajar as it had been left, and the windows were slipping by. They were long, but they slipped by nevertheless. He watched the starlings running and flying in little parties across the lawn. He counted them over and over again, with one eye always on that swinging door. A sour-faced maid came in to lay the table for tea, and still Conradin stood and waited and watched. Hope had crept by inches into his heart, and now a look of truth began to blaze in his eyes that had only known the wistful patience of defeat. Under his breath, with a furtive exultation, he began once again the pain of the and devastation. And presently his eyes were rewarded. Out through that doorway came a long, low, yellow and brown beast with eyes a-blink at the waning daylight and dark, wet stains around the fur of jaws and throat. Conradin dropped to his knees. The great polecat ferret made its way down to a small brook at the foot of the garden, drank for a moment, then crossed a little plank bridge and was lost to sight in the bushes. The passing of Sredni Vashtar. Tea's ready, said the sour-faced maid. Where's the mistress? She went down to the shed some time ago said Conradin. And while the maid went to summon her mistress to tea, Conradin fished a toasting fork out of the sideboard drawer and proceeded to toast himself a piece of bread. And during the toasting of it, and the buttering of it with much butter and the slow enjoyment of eating it, Conradin listened to the noises and silences which fell in quick spasms beyond the dining room door the loud, foolish screaming of the maid, the answering chorus of wandering ejaculations from the kitchen region, the scuttering footsteps and hurried embassies for outside help, and then, after a lull, the scared sobbings and the shuffling tread of those who bore a heavy burden into the house. Oh, I will break it to the poor child. I couldn't for the life of me, exclaimed a shrill voice. And while they debated the matter among themselves, Conradin made himself another piece of toast. There we are. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I will be back in the new year um, at the end of January. I hope you think up some questions and comments perhaps by then. But in the meantime, whatever you're doing over the new year break, I hope you have a relaxing and peaceful time and happy reading.